Welcome to our series, Chasing the Wind, a survey of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, where we'll learn some important life lessons from someone who had the resources to chase after everything this world has to offer. We hope you'll discover through this series what the author ultimately discovered. It's more rewarding to pursue the maker of the wind than chase after it. Let's now join Pastor Alan Brooks of New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, as he leads us in our study. But I just want to encourage you this morning and where we're going. As most of you know, we've started a new series in the book of Ecclesiastes. But to set the table, so to speak, for that this morning, I want to have you imagine with me for a moment a game where when you play the game, what would seem like the normal way you play it all of a sudden changes. For an example, let's say you're playing soccer. Your team's moving the ball down the field, and when you get down there with the ball finally, the net's gone. Somebody's actually moved the net. I mean, imagine how frustrating that would be, that you think you're in, headed in the right direction, but you can't arrive at the goal that you were intending to arrive at. Or some of you might enjoy the game of chess, as I do. Imagine chess. You're there getting ready to mat, make that final play on the queen for the other side. And right as you do that, that board changes right before your eyes. Phew, and a couple of other levels are added to it. Now, some of you have seen these, these three-dimensional chess boards. And you're going, oh, that's a little bit more of an adventure, a little bit more of a game. But what if, again, as you were getting close to that final move on the queen, all of a sudden it did it again. Phew, and it just went up. Where the goal of winning that game continues to be elusive. You can never quite grab onto it. And that's exactly what we're looking at in this book of Ecclesiastes. That's why I've titled this series, Chasing the Wind. Because whether some of us want to acknowledge it or not, we've either chased the wind or we're in the process of chasing the wind. Thinking that somehow when we get this, whatever this is, that that's going to give us the satisfaction or the pleasure that we're looking for. And that's what we're going to see Solomon at today. We're going to see Solomon pursuing pleasure. And let's see what the end is according to him. Join with me if you haven't already done so to chapter 2. Got a lot of scripture we're going to be reading through today. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under the heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun." What we see here real quickly is that Solomon is engaged upon a grand experiment, if you will. He wants to test all things to see if he can find the source of ultimate everlasting pleasure. I like the way the message translates a couple of these verses I read. 
Note verse 1, he says, I said to myself, let's go for it. Experiment with pleasure. Have a good time. Now, just stopping there for a moment, some of us have done that, haven't we? We've chosen to say, hey, I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to experiment with this thing, whatever this thing is, and see if indeed I can arrive at this place where I can find true and lasting pleasure. Solomon goes on to say that everything I wanted, I took. And he had the ability to do that. I never said no to myself. I gave in to every impulse, held back nothing. And I love the way this was translated. I sucked the morrow of pleasure out of every task. My reward to myself for a hard day's work. In brain science, they say there's a quartet of brain chemicals that will give us pleasure. When they're secreted into our system, they give us the feeling of pleasure or happiness. Some of you have heard these, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. Now some of these happen very naturally. They're things that God created in our bodies that are a natural source of pleasure and happiness for us. But unfortunately, many of us have sought to activate those chemicals artificially. And this is a little bit of what we see Solomon doing. It says that he pursued alcohol, specifically wine. You know, in 900 BC, which is about the time that we're talking, there really weren't a whole menu of choices that we see in our world today. So Solomon goes after the thing that's very abundant in his world. And I'm guessing this isn't Boone's farm, okay? I mean, this is a guy who's got tons of money, and he's got plenty of money to buy the best wine that's grown on the vine. Today, if he were here, maybe he would be following the track of some in the world of opiates and cocaine and all the other sorts of things that people pursue in this area. But for Solomon, when alcohol failed, when the test there showed that that wasn't the source of ultimate pleasure, he went to ambition. He pursued through his work this goal this he, that he was on, this pursuit that he was on. It's fascinating to me that in our culture, at least in the United States, very few people see the workaholic in the same light as they do the actual-aholic. You know what I mean by that? Now, truthfully, you can't get arrested for working too hard, but maybe some of us should. Because part of the problem in our culture today is that we've made that okay. And the reality is not unlike alcohol, not unlike some of these drugs do in bringing endorphins to the forefront of our brain and our body to give us pleasure, work and ambition does the same thing. That's why people become workaholics. It's just a different form of addiction. Solomon, it says here, in pursuing this, built all kinds of projects. And Solomon as a king was world-renowned for the building projects that he undertook. Great palaces, great buildings, not just in Israel but beyond. One of his greatest accomplishments was building the temple in Jerusalem. It's said that the temple, which was one of the wonders of the ancient world, one of the seven wonders, I believe, of the ancient world, it took three years to build this vic victorious, grand thing that we now know as the temple in Jerusalem. You might recall that King David was the one who wanted to build the temple. But God said, no, I'm going to let your son be the one who does that. And Solomon was that son. 1 Kings 7 in the Old Testament tells us that he also built a palace for himself. Note this, it took him 13 years to complete the construction on his own house. Now, some say it's not because his own palace was more elaborate than the temple. It's just that there was less diligence placed on building his palace than had been placed upon building the temple. In addition, it says that he built all of these grand gardens and vineyards and parks, is what we would call them today. In fact, I found an overhead view of one of those out just south of Jerusalem now, these three reservoirs that are just south of Jerusalem. And you'll notice on the side there how he's built all these trees around it. Those were originally built by King Solomon and are still in place today. 
Now, I don't believe that Solomon personally built these. I don't think he was out there carving and chipping away at the stone. He was working as the overseer, the GC we might call it in our world today, or the developer. Because it tells us that he, in fact, had large numbers of male and female slaves. In fact, a little curious note here is it says that many slaves were actually born in his home. Now, I didn't know this, I had to actually look it up, but what's significant about that is that was an additional sign of great wealth, is that you had slaves who lived in your home and were giving birth and reproducing even in the process of living within your home. That's how grand Solomon's home were. His slaves didn't go home somewhere, they actually lived within his own home. It also says in verse 9 what seems like a little bit of an arrogant statement, but I think there's more to it than meets the eye. He says, I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. As arrogant as that sounds, I think it's reasonable to believe it's somewhat accurate. 1 Kings 10 says that he was richer and wiser than any other king on earth. Even in this passage here in Ecclesiastes, we see that he owned large numbers of herds and flocks. Josephus, the historian, records that he had large numbers of horses and many stables that kept them. In addition, we know that he acquired large amounts of silver and gold. Check this out again from 1 Kings 10. Each year, Solomon received about 25 tons of gold. Does anybody know how many pounds in a ton? 2,000, right? So that's 50,000 pounds of gold that he receives every year. Do they sell or do they measure the value of gold based on a pound? No, it's based on the ounce. And there's 16 of those in the pound. You do the math on this, it works out to be about a billion dollars is what Solomon received just in revenue every year. This guy was extraordinarily wealthy. 1 Kings also says that he made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone. Isn't that insane? Reminds me a little bit about the streets that we'll look forward to in the New Jerusalem. Remember what they're made out of? Even fancier than Solomon's silver. But when ambition failed Solomon, he turned to what I'm calling arousal. He sought for his physical senses to be aroused. And he did that, it says, by hiring men and women singers. In other words, Solomon didn't go buy somebody's album. He bought the band. And the band literally lived in his house. They were the original entertainment center. You know how some of us just swip a, click a switch and you know the stereo pops on? Solomon just had to say, play for me. And all of a sudden they would start singing for him. In addition, the passage here tells us that he had many concubines. We talked about this last week, but we know that he had at least 300 concubines according to Scripture. And as we said last week, that's in addition to the 700 wives that he had. Here again, referring to Josephus the historian, he speaks of Solomon and says he grew mad, and this isn't mad in an angry way, but crazy in his love of women and laid no restraint on himself in his lusts. Nor was he satisfied with the women of his country alone, but married many wives out of foreign nations. So after the pursuit of all those things, what was his discovery? Verse 11 out of the message says, I took a good look at everything I had done, looked at all the sweat and hard work, When I looked, I saw nothing but smoke. Smoke and spitting into the wind. There was nothing to any of it. Nothing. Okay, some of us, when we were little boys, hopefully it was then, not as a man, but did you ever spit in the wind? We all know what happens when you do that, right? But that's what his experience has been like. As he's pursuing pleasure, it's like smoke. He seeks to grab it, and it goes right out of his hands. You ever tried to grab smoke before? You can't. You can't put your hands around it. And the truth is that many of us know that experience, don't we? 
We know having pursued through drugs or sex or rock and roll or whatever your thing is, that those things only satisfy for a time. And the problem with so many of them is what's satisfying and fulfilling in the beginning doesn't continue to fulfill, does it? What do we want? We want more. And then we want more. And then we want more because it takes more and more to satisfy us. Whether it's drugs, whether it's sex, whether it's any of those pleasure pursuits, they all ask more and more of us. And that's why people become addicts. See, some of us don't recognize that that's even true within the work world again, isn't it? So you get a little taste of success. You get that promotion. You get, get that upgrade in your paycheck. And you think, well, maybe man, man, I put in a little bit more time, work a little bit harder. And then you want more. And then you want more. That's the very thing that Solomon says was spitting into the wind. There was nothing to any of it. Go back to verse 12. He says, So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool so I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after the wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will be master of all for which I have toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity." So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What is a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow. His work is vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. So after his other pursuits of pleasure, Solomon comes to the point where he's contrasting the way of the wise with the way of the fool. He's contrasting those of us who have thought to be intentional and conscientious about the way we live out our life. And then he compares that with the people who have been unintentional, mindless, frivolous, we might say, in the way they've lived their life. And I love the conclusion, the way this is translated in the message, verse 13. He says, I did see that it's better to be smart than stupid. Would you agree? Because he sees that those who are walking in the light are more likely to be able to walk straight and continue. But those who are in the dark... They stumble. They fall. So he sees the advantage of living wise versus living as a fool. But then he realizes something. That they both share the same fate. He talks about this same event that both the fool and the wise share. And it's the event of death. And he looks and he goes, wow, the wise person does all this stuff, accumulates this wealth, does these grand things, and then they die. And then the money just goes to someone else who didn't even toil for it. And he begs the question, what if they are a fool? You know, they found that 90% of Americans, their inheritance is lost within three generations. Cornelius Vanderbilt, some of you remember the name Vanderbilt? 
made his fortune back in the 1800s in shipping and railroad, accumulated over a hundred billion dollars. 100 years after he died, there was a reunion of 120 of his immediate descendants. Wasn't a single millionaire in the room. The guy had amassed a hundred billion dollars and they blew it all. And he points out something very true. See, the reality is for those who often inherit those fortunes, they didn't toil for it. They didn't have to work hard for it. They didn't have the sweat equity in that stuff. So when it came to them, they were frivolous. They were foolish with it. And his point is, if that's going to happen anyway, what's the point of trying to amass the fortune? Because we're both going to die, and there's not going to be any remembrance of whether you're foolish or you were wise in your life. Again, he reaches this point where he recognizes that all of this is meaningless. Now, one of the challenges that I would suggest to you as we read this, both here and going forward, is that we have to realize that much of the time we read passages like this with New Testament eyes. And it's hard not to do that. But understand this, someone in Solomon's era, 900 B.C., they didn't really know much about life after this life. At best, it was mysterious. Maybe a few understood that there was a, a, a resurrection of life, an afterlife that was available. But generally, they saw it as the end. And so that's where Solomon's coming from. He sees that this life terminates and ends. And whether there's anything really beyond this, nobody was sure about that. You and I have the knowledge of a resurrection of life because of whom? Because of Jesus. It's because of the life and the teachings of Jesus that we have that understanding. And hopefully many of us have that hope of resurrection. I would agree with Paul in the New Testament where he writes the Corinthian church. He says, if there is no resurrection, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. Because that's where Solomon's at. He's like, you might as well get used to this idea. In fact, we see that's right where he lands on this in verse 24. He says, there is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner who is given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This, he says, is vanity and a striving after wind. Here we see something rare in the Old Testament scriptures, as well as rare within this book. But it's a coming together with two primary themes. The first theme is this idea of enjoying life. Eat, drink, be merry. Now some have suggested that Solomon is espousing the idea of hedonism. And for those of you that don't know what hedonism is, it's the minimization of pain and the pursuit of maximum pleasure. That's what a hedonist does. They pursue pleasure at all cost, trying to ignore any kind of pain in their life. But I don't believe that that's Solomon's purpose here. I was acquainted this week with this four-letter four thing that some of you are seeing out and about, apparently. Does anybody know what that stands for? You only live once. See, many in our culture are living with that kind of a mindset. And dare I say, that's the kind of mindset that Solomon is struggling with. You do all this and your life's over at a certain point. Nobody even remembers. Besides that, somebody else gets your stuff. And he gets to this place where he's struggling with, you only live once. But then we see he understands something really important, and it's a taste of more to come. But he points out to those who please God, God does what? He blesses them. Think about that practically. What does it mean to please God? Does it mean to live however we want, pursuing our own pleasures? Is that what it means to please God? 
Or is it to walk in His ways? To walk according to the way that He said we're to walk. Not, a way, not according to the way the world says we're to walk, but according to the way that He has told us to walk. And to those who please God, He blesses them. And then he also points out, besides God's providence of blessing, there also comes this other element of judging. That even those who don't please God, at some level, have to be accountable for the fact that they haven't pleased God. Job talks about this in his writing. He says that evil people have piles of money and may store away mounds of clothing. But the righteous will wear that clothing and the innocent will divide that money. Lest you think that that's an Old Testament concept, look at it from New Testament words. These are the words of our Lord. He's giving the parable of the talents. And he talks about that after this man comes back, this master, who I believe he's referring to himself, that there's an accounting that's going to take place. You might recall of the three servants, one of them had wasted the money and really done nothing with it. He buried it, in fact. And here are the words that the master spoke to him. You wicked and lazy servant. In fact, he asked, why didn't you at least deposit my money in the bank? At least I would have got some interest had you done that. But notice what happens. Then he, the master, ordered, take the money from this wicked servant and give it to my faithful servant to the one who had produced the most with what the master had given them. See, I think sometimes in our modern socialist mindset that's out there in in our world, we fail to realize that God, in fact, continues to bless those people that he chooses to bless because they are faithful and pleasing to him. And we wonder sometimes why we're not being blessed. Should we be surprised? Should we be surprised when we turn our back on God and we live according to our ways rather than His that for whatever reason we're facing trial and tribulation and life's tough? It's not that even those of us who are trying to walk according to God's ways won't face those things, but we face them in a different way. In fact, Paul the Apostle, when he was speaking to the church at Philippi, he said, I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Why? How has he learned to do that? He's done it because he knows he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. See, that's the thing that Solomon didn't have available to him. Solomon didn't have Jesus. What's our excuse? See, we have none, do we? See, everyone in this room, every person on this planet has access to the truth of who Jesus Christ is and whom is not only a promise of resurrection of life in the next life, but in whom there is a promise that He will see us through the trials and tribulations of this life. So that whether we have a lot or whether we have little, we know that we can do all things. Because he's constantly working in those situations. I think the sadness in the church world in particular today is that we've sometimes lost sight on that. And that many, even in church today, are still chasing the wind, thinking at some level it's going to be okay. It's going to somehow work out. You know, as I see this, I see a man named Solomon who was tremendously wealthy supposedly the wisest man who ever lived. You'll notice that as he was going down this road of experimentation, what did he say along the way? He said his wisdom was still with him. In other words, he wasn't giving himself over to complete indulgence. He was checking it out and then realizing and evaluating, this isn't where it's at. Checking it out, this isn't where it's at. And when he came to the end of it all, he realized none of this is the answer. And he's in this place left looking for an answer. And ultimately that answer comes in the person of Jesus Christ. I saw a documentary here just recently. A friend gave us a DVD for Christmas and it was about Steve McQueen, who some of you recognize the name of. 
I knew a little bit about Steve McQueen's life. I'd seen a few of his movies. But at one point, he was one of the most successful actors in all of Hollywood. And back in the day, this is back in the 70s, he would get upwards of 50 to an $80 million amount of money from these pictures that he was doing. Had tremendous wealth in his hands. And he, like so many others, pursued pleasure every place he could find it. Not unlike Solomon. In alcohol, in his pursuits in Hollywood, with women, all of those things. Great masses of wealth in motorcycles and cars, all that sort of thing. But at a certain point, he came to the same place that Solomon did and started to see he was chasing the wind. It was just smoke. And he became so upset and depressed about it that he almost withdrawed entirely and became a recluse. I was amazed when I saw pictures of him. He looked like a guy that you would see out on the street. Long, scraggly hair, big beard. And he withdrew from everything because he was lost until somebody introduced him to Jesus. And it was fortunate when it happened because it happened towards the end of his life. Because not long after that, he found out that he had a terminal form of cancer and died. But before the end, he was able to see the truth of what pleasure really is found in. And it's only found in the relationship and in the person of Jesus Christ. Do we have to be like Solomon or Steve McQueen to get there? Do we have to come to the end of our rope, literally, before we're going to give in and go, wow, God's way has got to be better? Or could we learn from these people who tried it all, sought pleasure from all these other things and realized, wow, it's a waste of time. It's like trying to catch smoke. See, if we'll learn from them, then we don't go all down all those rabbit holes, hopefully, right? We'll come to that place where we know that Jesus is the answer. I asked you on the front end to consider something. Is there something in your world that you're doing and chasing the wind? Maybe it's not drugs, sex, and rock and roll, or some of those things, right? Maybe you're a little more sophisticated than that. See, what you're chasing is success in the world. You're chasing that bigger paycheck or that bigger house or something like that. It's not like you're doing drugs or anything, right? And somehow we think that's what makes it better. When in fact, God is probably trying to get our attention and go, no, it's not here. It's not in this thing. I believe that some of us need to hear what Solomon learned today. Some of you right here today need to learn what Solomon learned. Is it all those things of this life? Chasing the wind. The only thing worthwhile is to come to the one who is the resurrection and the life. And his name is Jesus. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. We're going to do something a little bit different today. During these next two songs, I'm going to ask you to spend some time not only singing out to our God, and I think there's a couple of great songs that you'll have the opportunity to do that with, but more than that, I want you to have a conversation with God today as well. Now, if you don't know Him, today could be a day that you could introduce yourself to Him and say, tell you what, I'm hearing about these other people who live like fools. That's probably been me. I'm sorry. But I'm hearing today about one named Jesus, and I want to put my faith in Him, my trust in Him. I want to turn back towards God. But for some of the rest of us who think we're already facing towards God, that we've turned already towards Him, some of us need to up our commitment, I might say. We need to recognize that we're not really chasing the maker of the wind, we're out there chasing the wind, just like Solomon was. So take the time as we enter into these songs to really think about that for yourself. And if there's something that you need to confess before your Lord, take it to him. I'm sure he'd be glad to give you his forgiveness. Amen? Would you stand? Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.